Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Corey Rosen Lee, president of the Hawaii State Teachers Association. Um, and we're here today to talk about the constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot uh, this October for mail-in voters and November 6th for voters. There's been a lot of questions about it, and we're hoping to spend a little time be able to talk to our members, be able to answer those questions, and try to explain some of the misconceptions and misinformation that's out there as well. It's all, at the same time, trying to educate our members. Uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to speak a little about the constitutional amendment, why we need it. Uh, at the same time, we're going to take some of the criticisms, try to answer that one. But also, we want to take the chance to hear your comments, questions, and concerns as well. So during this time, if there's here something that you hear that you want to ask more about or you have some concerns, just type that into the comment section. At the very end, we'll try to answer that. Um, I'm here joined by some of the great staff at HSTA, including our Deputy Executive Director, Andrea Eshelman, and from our communications staff, Kyoki Kerr and Chris Schubert. So they'll be monitoring the comment sections, and then they'll be asking the questions later on and hopefully to answer that one. So first of all, <coughs> let me try to explain what is the Constitutional Amendment. Uh, the Constitutional Amendment reads as the following. Shall the legislature be authorized to establish, as provided by law, a surcharge on investment real property to support public education? And people will have a chance to vote on this. Mail-in votes are uh, going to start going out very soon to neighbor islands. And on Oahu, the mail-in votes will start as soon as October 17th. And the general election will be November 6th. Uh, a blank vote on the Constitutional Amendment actually asks as a no vote. So we're making sure that everyone hopefully will vote yes, but please do not leave a blank. So first the question is this. Why is this Constitutional Amendment needed? And the answer is Hawaii schools are dramatically underfunded. When you adjust for cost of living, Hawaii is 45th in the nation in per people expenditure. When you look at similar districts across the country, we spend about $6,000 less per pupil than our similar districts. And since Hawaii is a one state school system, the only comparison we have here in Hawaii is our private school system. And they spend ten dollars to $20,000 more per pupil. So no matter how you look at it, the reality is we do not fund our schools well. When you adjust for cost of living, our teachers are the worst paid in the nation. So what is the consequence of this? First of all, for the first time, this year, Hawaii surpassed over 1,000 classrooms that did not have a qualified teacher. And what we've seen is, just recently, Hawaii was ranked as the worst place in the nation for teachers. Since 2010, we've seen an increase of teachers leaving Hawaii to go to the mainland. And that has gone up by 84%. And the reason is simple. We're just not competitive. If a teacher can move to the mainland and make ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars more and have a lower cost of living, that's what they're going to do. But the real ones that are hurting in the circumstances are keiki, because too many of our keiki go day to day, go to school, and do not have a qualified teacher. In fact, by our estimates, one third of our students every day go to school and have at least one teacher that's not qualified. At the same time, we're not recruiting enough people to go into the teaching profession. We've seen a decrease in the amount of college students that want to become teachers. And so we have these two factors that are coming together that basically is not healthy for our keiki. Because every, we have the strong belief that every child, regardless of where they live, what their ethnicity is, that every child should have the opportunity to have a quality education. And we believe that starts by making sure that we have great teachers in every one of our classrooms. Um, and I've had a chance to meet a lot of you and hear about your concerns. And funding does impact it. Um, you know, a lot of our special education teachers across the state have shared the enormous burden that they're under right now. That when it comes to special education, that there's just too many IEP caseloads that they have to take. And they've asked, well, can't we decrease the amount of um, our caseloads? And we absolutely agree. The problem is, right now, we're short about three to 500 special education teachers. So if we want to give our special education students the schools they deserve, the question is, how do we ensure that we have enough special education teachers? And again, teacher pay is not going to solve every problem. But unless we're competitive, we're not going to have people go into the profession, and we're not going to have enough teachers. And unless we have enough teachers, we cannot lower the caseload and provide the services we need to have for our students. The same thing applies for things such as class size. 
when teachers talk about how large their class sizes are, again, we need more teachers to lower the class sizes. We want to expand private, uh, pub we want to expand public preschool. And again, in order to do that, we need to have lots of teachers. So funding comes back in so many different ways. And if you look at our facilities, and we're all very aware of it, we still have too many classrooms that are hot. We have uh, too many buildings that are getting older without any sign that they're going to improve the conditions. We have broken desks, old textbooks. Everything comes back to money. And we've got to fund our schools. Um, and the public agrees. 74% of the public agrees we need to increase funding for our public schools. That's Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. All of them agree we need to increase funding for our schools. The only question is, how do we do that? Okay. First of all, the underfunding of our schools is not just a Hawaii problem. Uh, we know that across this country, we have seen our fellow teachers having to take action in order to fund our schools. Um, we've seen in West Virginia, and Oklahoma, and Arizona, and Colorado, and North Carolina, and Kentucky. Uh, and each of them, you've got to find a way to fund their schools. In Oklahoma, they asked for an oil and gas tax. In Arizona, it was an income tax increase. In Oregon, it was a corporation tax. We have to find a way that would work for Hawaii, and every system is unique. So we've spent many years trying to find a way to increase funding for our public schools. And we've looked at everything. I mean, during this, we've heard ideas of things such as the lottery or marijuana, uh, gambling, all sorts of creative ideas. The reality is they either are regressive taxes, which heavily tax the poor, or they don't bring in enough money. There are reality are only four ways in order to increase funding for our public schools. That is the general excise tax, the property tax, the income tax, and the hotel tax. We have tried three of the four in the last three years. And the same people that say, well, they don't like the, pro we, the same opposition to this that have suggested that, yes, we need to increase funding for our schools, but don't like the property tax. The reality is they have fought us for three years. Three years ago, we tried a 1% increase in the general excise tax. That would have brought in close to $800 million for our public schools. And unfortunately, that did not pass. But when we talked to a lot of legislators, they suggested the property tax. And the reason why is simple. Hawaii is the only state in the entire country that has not used property taxes to fund our schools. And at the same time, we have the lowest property tax rate in the entire country. Well, some people say, well, this is a good thing to have a low property tax. But actually, the opposite is true. Because what happens is, is that when you have such a low property tax, especially on outside investors, this creates the problem of encouraging too many uh, mainland informed buyers to use Hawaii as basically uh, investment paradise for themselves. As recently said in Business Insider uh, magazine, Hawaii was considered a billionaire's paradise. But the problem is that's pricing everyone out of their own home. So what we've been trying to do for the last two years is to get a ballot measure to put property taxes on the ballot. And the reason why is, again, Hawaii is the only state that has not used property taxes in order to fund its schools. And this is why our schools are underfunded. So what we needed to do was we needed to create a ballot measure to go to the people. Um, and this is a two-step process. What you have to do is, one, is change the Constitution. And then once the Constitution is changed, you need to have something called an enabling bill. The enabling bill is the specific language in order to actually implement that constitutional change. Um, right now, we know in Hawaii that one third of all property is actually owned by people that do not live in Hawaii. Last year in Maui, 52% of all homes were purchased by people that don't live here. So what we've been specifically looking at is this. Second homes over a million dollars. We do not want to tax renters and small businesses and everything else. But we're asking for these very wealthy people to contribute their fair share in order to be able to help Hawaii's public schools. So what's going to happen is, is that this ballot language would go onto the ballot. And if it's approved by the people, then what we would do is put in the enabling language. And the enabling language would be very specific. And it would suggest certain things of where the money would go, 
who would be taxed, and how it would be collected. But this is a two-step process. Now, let's look at some of the criticisms that some of our opponents have had in this situation. Okay? And first of all, let me describe who our opposition is. They call themselves the Affordable uh, Coalition, Home Coalition, Affordable Hawaii Coalition. But you've got to follow the money. These people are not interested in making Hawaii affordable. These are very wealthy individual, individuals and corporations who have one purpose. That is protecting their own wealth. They do not want to pay their fair share in order to fund Hawaii schools. So let's suggest what they've been doing. They've been putting out commercials and they've been trying to use fear. They're trying to suggest that if this constitutional amendment passes, that everything's going to go wrong, that we're going to raise the rent of people and we're going to take commercial businesses and cut up small mom and pop stores and run them out of business. And they're just trying to use fear. And, and the, the reason is why is because of this. Only about 4% of all homes in Hawaii are second homes over a million dollars. And of that, 75% are owned by people that do not live in Hawaii. So only 1% of all of the second homes over a million dollars in Hawaii are actually owned by Hawaii residents. You cannot win a ballot measure with 1%. So what they've got to do is, in order to win this, is they've got to scare people and have people vote against their own interests. That's why they've been using things such as fear and using commercial properties. That is not going to happen. It's never been the intent. And what they're really just trying to do is to scare people to vote no and that we do not fund our public schools. Another concern that they brought up is that it's vague. Why isn't it more specific? And the answer to that one is this. All we're trying to do right now is to change the Constitution to allow something to occur. Even if we vote yes uh, during the ballot, it doesn't change anything. It just creates a change in the Constitution to allow something to occur. So, they want all the details in the Constitution. Well, that's not the way it works. As one teacher put it best, the Constitution doesn't say where you put stop signs. So what would occur is this. If the Constitutional Amendment passes, we put in the language next. And that would be very specific. How we're going to spend the money. Who's going to collect the money. Who's going to do this. And what we're going to put forward, and what legislators have told us that they want to put forward as well, is attack second homes over a million dollars. Not renters, not commercial businesses, not Kuleana lands, all of these things. And there are many ways within that bill to create exemptions to try to avoid things such as multifamily homes and other ways to make sure that we do not hurt the citizens of Hawaii. Everything else is just fear. Um, another concern that they brought up is that it's going to hurt the counties. Now let me try to answer this one. First of all, this is a surcharge. It does not take one dollar away from the counties. And the counties in Hawaii are the only ones in the entire country that do not have to spend anything to fund their public schools. And that's part of the reason why our schools are underfunded. So what we're going to try to do is this will not take one dollar away from the counties, but is a surcharge. And the best way to explain it is this way, is that when you pay for a gas, you have a local, a state, and a federal tax. And that's how you get funded. And that's what a surcharge is. Um, let me take two more concerns that they suggest. One is this. The DOE has plenty of money, and it's just being wasted. Before we raise taxes, what we should do is an audit of the DOE. What always amazes me about this argument is this, that a lot of these people that are making this argument are okay with spending $30,000 for a Punahou or a private school education and don't think that's wasted, but somehow spending $10,000 for a regular education student in Hawaii is wasted. The reality is they do not want to fund uh, education at all, and they're just trying to find any excuse in order to do it. No one's against an audit. We all believe in being more accountable and being more transparent. So go ahead. For these same people, once an audit's done and the audit shows that Hawaii schools are spending $6,000 less than their mainland counterparts, when it shows that we have a shortage of 1,000 teachers, they are not going to go around asking for any type of revenue increase. The idea is this is just an excuse for them to delay the process and to make sure we never properly fund our public schools. The other suggestion is that legislators just need to make education a bigger priority and that they should somehow find the money inside the legislative budget in order to do it. The hard part about it is this. It's not just about making education a priority. Oftentimes there's very competing interest in the legislature. And any legislature that says that, the question is what are they willing to cut? 
Are they going to try to cut health care for senior citizens or food for the homeless? Of course not. What they're really just trying to say is they're not going to fund public education. Uh, it takes courage to go out there and to say not only what you should fund public education, but how you're going to do it. And that is why we have put up ideas in order to do that and have pursued that. The other concern we hear is about supplanting. And supplanting is the argument is this. How can you guarantee that if we increase the funding, that it will actually go to our classrooms where it's needed? Well, the first part about that argument I like to say is this. Well, we all agree then that we need to increase funding. And then if we can all agree we need to increase funding and we need to find additional revenue, then we still need to work on the problem how to make sure we don't supplant it. And there are ways to do that. Two years ago, when we put up the legislation, we specifically put into the bill that they could not lower the uh, DOE budget and they had to go up with inflation. Another way to protect it is our contract. And our contract is just not about teacher pay. In our last contract, we put up 17 pages of proposals in order to improve special education. We put up language to make sure that teachers wouldn't have to teach in hot classrooms. We put up many proposals in order to improve our schools. And by law, the state has to fund the contract. So if they're worried about supplanting, there are ways of solving that, and that's what we can put in next year. Okay? Now, through this process, our opposition has plenty of money, and they're trying to kill this. But if you pay a close attention, they offer no solutions. All they offer is fear. If we can agree, that everyone agrees that we need to give our cakey a quality education, if we all agree we need to increase funding for our public schools, then we need to have this conversation continue. And if we can fund our pools properly, then we can make sure that we give all of our cakeys, our cakeys the schools they deserve. So at this time, I'm going to try to take some questions and try to see if we can answer those questions as best as we can. Okay. Corey, we, you touched on it already, but what we did have a question early on from Paul, uh, who, who says a lot of skeptics you talk to complain that any additional funds won't make it to our cake. Uh, Paul wants to know how can we guarantee that schools are improved and funds will make it to where they are intended to okay. go. This is a thing that we all must do. So the uh, question is basically, Paul was asking the question of how can we guarantee that the money will go to the classroom. There's one guarantee that we can give everyone. If this ballot measure fails, we can give a 100% guarantee we will not increase funding for our public schools. Now, next thing is, is that this must be a community effort to make sure that the funding, we do it properly. If we can agree that we need to increase funding for our public schools, then the next step has to be that we then work with legislators to make sure that they, we keep them accountable to make sure that we properly, uh, make sure that the additional funding will go to the classroom. And so as I stated before, there are a couple ways to do this. We can put in the legislation that they cannot decrease educational funding. So all the additional revenue will do, go to uh, our schools. The second way is to make sure that we put it in our contract, to make sure that we put the language in the contract that specifically tries to deal with the issues that we think are so important. multi-million dollar second home or condo, although nice, isn't necessarily part of their strategy. So dissuading these investors from their you know, $1 million plus properties that we've been targeting uh, will only focus investors' attention on properties that are cheaper than that, below that million dollar mark. Uh, Reed says you know, the concern is it would further reduce supply for locals because they would, they would target um, you know, multiple cheaper properties in turn impacting both sales and rental markets. How can we pre prevent this from happening? Reed wants to know. So Reed was asking the question is, is that if we put a surcharge on second homes over a million dollars, would that just encourage people to, these foreign buyers, to buy uh, homes that are less than a million dollars for their properties instead of that one? Uh, and what we've seen is this, um, that mainland buyers and foreign buyers spend significantly more for the property than local residents. In fact, foreign buyers spend 50% more. They're looking for things that can dramatically increase their wealth. Um, so we need, and by the way, what happens is this. So a report was done by Appleseed recently that suggests that one out of every 10 homes in Kauai is actually a vacation rental. 60% uh, of all townhomes in Maui are purchased by non-residents. And that is decreasing the market for everyone else. 
at the same time, it's raising the cost of each of these properties because you have a lower supply. Um, our biggest goal is this. Now, I've been asked many times, why don't we just create a law that tax foreigners or mainlanders more than Hawaii residents? And that's actually unconstitutional. Uh, New Zealand was able to do something like that, but they have a different constitution. So what we've been trying to do is this is why the bill is specifically tailored to uh, non-owner occupied property, second homes. And so this is the way to try to protect both renters and Hawaii residents from having to pay this higher tax. There's no perfect way of doing that and still being able to be legal. But what we'd like to do is target as much as possible these illegal vacation rentals, these expensive properties, any way to make sure that you know, we are trying to go after these people that are using Hawaii as their investment property rather than the homes that they're actually trying to live in. Corey, what about, uh, we have a lot of teachers listening because they're on their fall break right now, many of them. Uh, what can people do who want to support this proposal? So the question is, what can teachers do to support this proposal? You know, one of the things that we've had is when we've talked to people, and we cut through the fear, and we actually explain this for this, people support this. Uh, the reality is, is that when you explain to people that what, why our schools need the funding, that this is going after second homes over a million dollars, they support it. We need teachers to be able to share their stories, and there are many ways to do that. I appreciate all of you on Facebook Live right now listening to this one, but we can share these stories. We need people to knock on doors and share it with their neighbors. Uh, the idea is we need people to be able to tell them what's going on in our schools, why our schools need funding, and to try to cut through some of this fear of why uh, it's going to try to attack everyone. And we all know that. But like I said before, 74% of people in Hawaii believe in increasing funding for our schools, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. So if we can just make sure that they understand the details of this constitutional amendment, we believe they will support it. Okay, Corey, there's another question that came in from Chantel, who says, many people still misunderstand the vagueness of the wording of the constitutional amendment. Uh, how will you be sure that it becomes clear to voters that it can be changed after the fact? Chantel wants to know. So Chantel asked a question about the vagueness. Okay. Um, there's two things to do with this. Um, we did put up a bill last year, and if you look at it, you can go back in the archives of the legislature, and that's SB 683 and SB 686. That lays out in very detailed language of what would happen. If the constitutional amendment passes, we're going to take a bill, or a very similar bill, and put that up. Uh, the vagueness is just to, when we, the, the language of the constitutional amendment ha cannot lay out every specific provision. It is the constitution but we will be putting up very specific language. And then what it's going to need is it's going to take everyone to put pressure on the legislature to one, to enact that language, but also to be very specific. And, and legislators get this. One of the most frustrating pro uh, parts of this process has been is the idea of, and, 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 and look, I get it. You know, trusting legislators is a difficult thing to do. But the one thing you can trust is this, is legislators need to get reelected. And if they went after renters or commercial businesses, they wouldn't get reelected, and that's why they're not going to do it. We've had hundreds of conversations about funding our schools with legislators and about this constitutional amendment. And it's been very clear talking to legislators that their intent is the same as ours, which is to tax second homes over a million dollars. And that's exactly the language that will be put into the enabling bill once this uh, constitutional amendment passes. Well, let's give everyone a second. Uh, we'll always encourage more comments, and I'm sure some of you are not seeing this live, but will we see it recorded as well? So I would encourage you to also put in your comments as well. Uh, okay. So as, as in my communications, there are ways to find out more information. You can go to our website, uh, yesforourkeiki.com. It has lots of information. We have our Facebook page as well, uh, facebook.com uh, backslash yesforourkeiki. Um, and that would also give you information as well. We encourage you to look at this information and to read as much as you can, to follow the process that's gone through for this many years. Um, one of the things that... The video got interrupted for some reason. Okay. Okay. 
Sorry, we got interrupted there for a second. Um, there are many ways to find out information, and we need to make sure that people know as much information about this in the case. Um, one of the things that has been frustrating through this process is some people have suggested, well, let's make it better. Of course we want better. But this has been the best opportunity to have. It's taken a hard fight. And I want to thank a lot of you teachers that are watching this. You have made the possibility even to do this. This is the first time in Hawaii's history that we're actually going to have a ballot measure to give the people the chance to vote to increase funding for our public schools. And our opponents did not want even you to vote. And they're still trying to stop it. They've gone to the Supreme Court trying to stop the ballot question. They fought for years to do this one. It's been a testament to the hard work of all of our community supporters, teachers, parents, students across the state, even to get to this point where we actually get the first chance to increase funding for our public schools. And that's why we're encouraging every single person to vote. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I'm getting texts as well, and one person was texting. Can you explain the difference? Because I think people are concerned when they hear a million dollars threshold, and they're thinking it applies to the house in which they live and the homeowner. So can you explain the difference between investment residential properties and actually owner-occupied uh, homes? So one of the questions is, is the concern is this, is that a person says, I live in a home over a million dollars. Am I going to get taxed? And the answer is no. Uh, we do not want to go over um, homeowner, homeowner property. Look, we have seen in Hawaii that the increase of housing has increased, doubled in the last 15 years. Um, and we need some ways to curtail the speculation that's driving up the cost of living. One of the hardest concepts to try to explain is this, that actually low property taxes, especially on speculative buyers, is increasing the cost of living for everyone in Hawaii. And you need to somehow contain that. We are not going after uh, homeowner occupied property, no matter regardless of what the cost is. And the only people that are suggesting that are the people that are trying to kill this constitutional amendment and trying to make sure we do not fund our schools well. We're hearing also from a number of teachers on different islands, including Caroline from Kauai, who asks, talked about this a little earlier, but I know people are joining it in progress. Uh, what, what can HSPA members and teachers do to help support uh, this effort to make sure that the constitutional amendment passes? So we had a teacher ask the question again, what can they do to help? Uh, there are many things we can do. And again, the biggest thing is we need to have lots of conversations. Uh, work with your fellow HSPA teachers. Find out with the canvassing dates that are going around in your neighborhoods. Um, we have ways to pass out um, walking pieces. Share the information with your neighbors. Uh, the thing is this, if people know more about this, if they can cut through, and, and by the way, our opponents, they have a lot more money than teachers do. Uh, and what they're going to do is spend a lot of money trying to confuse and trying to make people afraid. Our biggest weapon is this. We are 13,500 members strong, and we are teachers which means we have the great ability to educate. And we need to educate not just our students in this thing, but we need to educate all of Hawaii on, number one, why we need to fund our schools and why this uh, constitutional amendment is good for them as well. I'm just trying to look for anything else that we haven't covered here. Another follow-up question is just on what are the resources that are available for people who support this? Can you talk again about the, the, the website, website and, and okay. Facebook? So the, the question is where we can find out more resources on this one. Um, would you please go to our website, yesforourkeiki.com, and our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com, yesforourkeiki, and you will find lots of articles and sources of information. What we've done is we have something called the 20 reasons why to vote for the constitutional amendment. These are the 20 reasons that we've mentioned before, each that are sourced so you can uh, click on them to find out the original source of the information. Not only why our schools are underfunded, um, what the problems is with this underfunding, but also why a uh, surcharge on uh, second homes over a million dollars is the best way in order to fund our schools. Okay. And if teachers want to want, want some uh, tools for their arsenal, right, they're able to contact their, can you tell them about contacting their UD for, for those kinds okay. of things, yard signs and so on? So if you want to put up a yard sign, if you want uh, walking. walking pieces, um, please contact your Uniserve director or your chapter president. 
uh, and we can be able to get that information to you and get those things so you can be able to help. And we do need every single teacher out there trying to help and to educate the public on this matter. Okay. Um, from Julia, just a question, sent in a question. How do we know where the money will go? We talked about this earlier, but it's good to talk about it again. How do we know where this money will go and what we are trying to fund specifically? That's from Julia. So the question from Julie is how we know where the money will go and how can we make it go to the specific things that we need to try to get to. Um, there are many ways to do this, uh, but let's make sure is this. The first thing is this. Again, I think everyone can agree we need to increase funding for our schools. This cannot be a one-time thing. This will be a continuous uh, fight for us to make sure that we properly fund our schools. So what we can do is this. We will be putting in very specific language, um, and if you go back, and we did have this language before, to specifically look at how we can fund our schools. Uh, the needs that we know is this. One is we've got to pay our teachers better. Um, the reality is we're just not competitive, and we need to be able to create this dedicated fund in order to make sure that we have something that we can collectively bargain for. We want to make sure that we improve special education. Uh, our special education teachers, I know if you're watching this, we, they need help. Uh, we need to make sure that we can uh, either find resources in order to be able to lower their load or to be able to uh, incentivize those that are willing to go into special education. One of the things that we are feel is very important is lowering class sizes. Um, the research is very clear on the benefit of public preschool. And again, all of that requires revenue, but that is specifically what we will be putting into the language next year, and that is what we've done so in the past as well. Okay? So listen, I want to thank all of you uh, um, for watching this. Uh, thank you for the questions. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more conversation in the comment section following along, and we can still have this debate. Um, please make sure you go out and vote yes on the constitutional amendment. And if you have any more questions, please be willing to contact us. You can reach us at info at hsta.com. Dot org. Dot org, sorry. Info at hsta.org. Um, but please, uh, thank you, and thank you for all the work you do in helping uh, the KK of Hawaii. Could you talk about thank you. Uh, that this will be archived for their fellow teachers and they can share this with their teachers? So our communications has asked me to share this along, that this is going to be archived. You can share this and share this with your fellow teachers so that they can be as uh, well informed and to make sure they get all the information correctly. Other than that, thank you so very much and have a good fall break. <laughs>